Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for another Mass Medic webinar. Today, we are talking about the benefits of automation in medical device manufacturing. And I'm pleased to present this webinar today from Epson and Lennon Industrial Services. If you haven't met me, I'm Anna King, a marketing coordinator at MassMedic. And if you're not familiar with our organization, we're a membership-based trade association for the medical device industry. And we work to promote our ecosystem in New England through connection, education, events like this, uh, advocacy and awareness. I do have a quick housekeeping note before I turn it over to our presenters. This webinar is being recorded, so all registrants will receive the recording after the presentation. We're also allocating some time for a Q&A at the end, so please make sure to put all of your questions in the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. And now I'm pleased to introduce Danielle Collins. Danielle has been in the automation industry for more than 25 years in roles ranging from application engineering to product management and business development. And in 2014, she moved to the Caribbean and started a consulting company where she helped manufacturers of automation products develop and implement products and marketing strategies. After moving back to the US in 2021, she decided that she wanted to be more directly involved with the products again and found the perfect opportunity as a robotics product manager with Epson. So thank you so much for being here. I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Anna. I'd like to introduce also Peter Lennon, who's presenting with me today. He's president and lead designer of Lennon Industrial Services. A manufacturer of custom machinery and process control for science and industry. And today we're going to give you some insights into how automation can benefit medical device manufacturers. Let me share my screen with you. There we go. All right, let's start this off by taking a quick look at the current state of the automation industry. So you guys have no doubt heard about the tremendous growth that automation has seen across all types of industries. One of the key metrics that demonstrates this growth is the sales data for industrial robots. So as you see here, from 2016 to 2019, robot sales saw a compound annual growth rate, or what we call a CAGR, of 16%, I'm sorry, of 12%. Companies, uh, mostly medium and larger size organizations, expanded their automation capabilities. Then there was a pronounced but short drop off in 2020 due to COVID, but that was followed by an equally rapid and pronounced rebound. Now the forecasted CAGR for North American industrial robot sales through 2026 is 16%. So what's driving this increase? There are several factors, but two that are really worth zeroing in on. First, labor costs have risen across the globe but as you can see here, the blue line, particularly in China. So over the past four decades, China has been the world's factory, but they've been forced to automate as their labor costs have risen, just like the rest of the world. As costs in these traditionally low cost countries rise, offshore manufacturing, of course, gets more expensive. So that makes companies think twice about how they automate. Second, the cost structure there we go. The cost structure of industrial robotics and peripherals has fallen dramatically over the past 10 or 20 years. This has brought automation within reach of a broader segment of the market. And that's particularly true for smaller companies who traditionally have problems justifying automation. As costs have come down, the adoption of automation has reached a tipping point. You see that in the UN economic data set from Europe on the right, where sales have accelerated as unit costs have come down. So how do you know if you should consider automation? Well, automation has traditionally been used when companies wanted to improve quality or throughput or reduce cost, whether that be cost due to labor, due to scrap or rework, bad quality. But over the past several years, the pandemic really highlighted some other benefits of automation. First, automation was invaluable during the pandemic in protect protecting workers. It helped overcome labor shortages and helped to mitigate supply chain issues. 
But manufacturers of medical devices, you guys face some unique requirements that other industries don't typically have to contend with. So any automation project that a medical device manufacturer undertakes needs to address these unique requirements as well. Now, traceability is important in a lot of different industries, but when it comes to manufacturing medical devices, traceability and verification are a requirement at every step of the manufacturing process. Then there's the issue of compliance. It can be difficult to ensure that people comply with processes or if there's a change to a process. But with automation, you know your manufacturing is consistent and it's in compliance with, it, with whatever the approved processes are. And of course, when you're manufacturing a medical device, contamination and cleanliness are extremely important. For example, if you've got a process that involves adhesives or if your manufacturing equipment uses lubricants and all mechanical equipment needs lubrication, those substances have to be carefully controlled to make sure they don't contaminate the product. But with medical devices, even processes that aren't required to be manufactured in a certified clean room per se, they still require a much higher cleanliness standard than typical manufacturing processes do. And on the, on the topic of clean rooms, um, automation can dramatically reduce the footprint of a process required in a clean room. Uh, you know, when people work around machinery, it take up a lot of space because the work surfaces all have to be arranged on a uh, uh, ergonomic level. Um, automated machinery can utilize space in all directions. And with the price of clean room space being very expensive, uh, this can give you many benefits uh, to, to the use of robotics. So how do you decide what to automate? In most manufacturing facilities have dozens, if not hundreds of processes that could be automated. It's important to evaluate which ones should be automated. So if you're faced with choosing which processes to automate, or if you're just trying to decide which things to begin with, four things to look for. <clears throat> processes that are consistent, that are repetitive, that are error prone, especially when done manually by humans, or that are hazardous to personnel. One example, a good example of this is sharps manufacturing needles and lancets. Even when you're manufacturing sharps, there's a high risk of harm to the operators, of course, and also a high risk of damage to the devices because they're extremely delicate. Quality inspections, another area that can often benefit from automation, especially if your quality checks require a high level of focus on a certain parameter or on a set of parameters, because people have difficulty maintaining focus to be consistent over long periods of time. And this can lead to what we call escapes. And that's when a defective product makes it through production and actually gets shipped. I'd like to add that robotics opens up a whole world in inspection. And it's not just in vision, uh, like a lot of people think sometimes. Um, for example, we uh, automated a, a system where workers were measuring parts with micrometer. And they would squeeze a little if it was too big or not as much if it was too small. And of course, people want things to be right. And um, so uh, our solution was to create a system where the automation fed a, a post series of probes that all measured the part that, uh, simultaneously, saved a lot of time. But the, the measurement was objective because it um, it was the same, the, the mechanisms would create the same measurement every time. And um, uh, that's one of the key benefits of robotic and automated measurement is that it is objective and it never fudges the numbers. Yeah. And don't forget about packaging, which is often the low hanging fruit for automation, since packaging typically involves processes that just aren't quite as complex as most manufacturing steps. Packing is also highly repeatable and involves significant ergonomic issues for personnel. So you've got repeatable, consistent, and 
hazardous for sure and potentially error prone. So again, perfect opportunities for automation. And some of the processes we just talked about, like handling small, fragile, or dangerous parts, just aren't well suited for human operators. But another area that has a high potential of high potential, excuse me, for failure when done by humans is data collection and verification. And this is an area where automation can really shine. Uh, information about each part can be accurately, instantly recorded and shared with a quality management system or other interested parties. Um, when manufacturing medical devices or products, each step in the process may need to be verified in order to confirm that it was within the predefined parameters. This is critical to assuring parts are, that the parts produced are good. So keep in mind, your customers may reject an entire lot, even if a single part is bad. So having this automated uh, recording of data and having that database of information is vital to verify uh, the production. So despite all that, you might be wondering, aren't there some processes that just have to be done manually? Well, in some cases, yes, but the number of applications and the types of applications that absolutely require human intervention is shrinking. And that's because advanced functions are integrated with robot solutions. They made it possible to automate things that couldn't be addressed just a few years ago. For example, now we have robots with integrated vision that can be used to check and verify parts are correct or within specs before any downstream processes like gluing or cutting or assembly take place. So you've not only reduced errors and scrap, but the vision can also help with verification and traceability for regulatory compliance. And robots with integrated force guidance, now they make it possible to assemble very small, delicate, high precision components with very precise tolerances something that really is difficult for humans to do without error and without, um, without scrap. So again, you reduce the chance for damage and scrap and rework by using automation. So let's look at some real world examples where an automated system has helped, menu, uh, med pardon me, helped medical device manufacturers achieve higher reliability, better quality and traceability or higher throughput. So in the first example, we have a pharmaceutical OEM who had developed a process for manufacturing syringes out of plastic, but with a proprietary coating that gave them properties similar to glass. So the OEM, they wanted to automate the process, not only to reduce costs, but also to make mass production feasible, which of course was very important during the height of the pandemic. So they developed an automation system using four Epson clean room rated SCARA robots to handle and position the syringes during the coating and the sealing processes, and also during the labeling process. The robotic system can produce 38 coated syringes per minute, and it eliminated a full production step. So that means it eliminated or it produced fewer opportunities for errors in the manufacturing process. In this example, our customer needed a more efficient way to insert rubber plugs into an opening that in a rigid plastic cap. And there was two different plugs which were soft and tended to mushroom under pressure. So inserting them by hand was uh, very difficult and physically taxing on the assemblers and led to ergonomic issues. And we designed a clean room ready machine that combined tooling, uh, custom tooling with the, an Epson T3 SCARA robot to solve the problem. The robot positioned the plugs over the opening, and then a cage reached up through the hole and surrounded the, ca uh, the plug and pulls the plug down through the hole without uh, it having to be pressed. Uh, the robot follows the motion and fully seats the cap um, uh, in, uh, uh, when it's bottomed out. So uh, because of the robot's reach and rotational range of motion, it serves two feeder bowls on either side of the system. 
So not only was the ergonomic strain on the assemblers completely eliminated, but the throughput was increased and we were able to automatically inspect the finished part as well. Also, this is a good example of uh, collaborative versus non-collaborative uh, robots. Um, the, um, uh, for, for those in the audience who are familiar with the difference between collaborative and non-collaborative robots, collaborative robots have sensors designed to detect when they come in person, in contact with a person or an object. This can be useful, but it has a price. Um, the collaborative robots are much less accurate and need to move more slowly in order to realize the collaborative functionality. Also, they're typically two to three times more expensive. So the, the, the equipment in this example demonstrated that a well-designed guarding system uh, using light curtains allows the safe use of a non-collaborative robot in close proximity to human workers. The benefit of the solution is that you get the speed and precision of an industrial robot, but more economically with much higher performance. Thanks, Peter. That is an excellent description or example of when a collaborative robot really isn't the best solution and the benefits of an industrial robot sometimes over a collaborative. And that's something I think a lot of people are grappling with right now as collaboratives have really gained um, a lot of prominence in the marketplace. That's right. So we've got another example here uh, dealing with electronic products. So we all know that electronic, anything electronic, all of your uh, devices, your wearables, they're shrinking. They're getting smaller and smaller. And this is especially so in the medical field. Implants, things are much, much less, um, less bulky and less intrusive than they were 10 or especially 15 or 20 years ago. But this has made precision manufacturing even more important for quality and reliability of these components. So in this application, we have a customer who needed 100% inspection of the micro wires on an implanted medical device to ensure the device was functional. So of course, you don't want any medical device to fail, but functionality and reliability are of absolute utmost importance for implants. So not only do we need to test it, but we need to also collect uh, verification data for traceability. So in this case, the customer used uh, Epson robots with both integrated vision and integrated force guidance to do the testing and verification of the microwires. So perfect example of one of the benefits of automation that we talked about earlier, the ability to handle and assemble small, delicate devices. So when you're choosing a robot for an automation project, don't just look at catalog specs. Make sure you or your supplier is doing real world feasibility testing to ensure the precision, the cycle times, even things such as vision functionality can perform at the level you need for your process. And here's an example of automation addressing the safety issues that we've talked about a couple of times and using the example of scalpels or sharps that we talked about earlier. Here we have blades presented in bulk to a parts feeder to be separated for the next operation for the assembly into scalpels. Well, because they're blades, the surface of the parts feeder had to be both translucent and it had to be resistant to scratches and nicks. So in this case, the customer was able to use a special material for the parts feeder surface along with Epson, our scarer robots with integrated vision guide to reliably pick and handle the blades to assemble scalpels. That took the human workers and obviously the danger to workers dealing with sharps completely out of the process. So once you've looked at your manufacturing operations and you've, de you've decided there are one or maybe several operations that are good candidates for automation, what next? Automation projects are complex, so where do you start? The first step is to define the process. Well, that's the first step in just about any project. But in this case, you don't just look at the overall process. You have to map out all the sub-processes, material flows, what are your incoming materials, what are your outputs, and don't forget about data. Data can be an input and an output. 
and especially in medical device manufacturing, data flow can be just as important as your material or your process flow. I'd like to, to add, um, the raw materials is uh, extremely important in planning or thinking about an automation project. If you can't control the quality of your raw materials, it'd be very difficult um, for an automation system to perform reliably. Um, variability variability in, in dimensions or surface finish or even color can lead to problems with the process. So raw materials are one of the most important aspects uh, to consider when de designing an automation system. Uh, study all the variables you likely see and make sure that the automation can handle those. Um, on the data process, uh, data uh, issue, define what information needs to be gathered and in what format does it need to be delivered. Sometimes it's as simple as physically rejecting a bad part or passing a good one. Uh, it could also be as involved as saving measurements uh, from each part and process uh, conditions that it was made under to a database. And often data needs to be read from the database to configure the process or condition uh, on uh, process, I'm sorry, the process conditions on product changeover, like recipes and um, like that. So being aware of all of the properties required for the finished product may seem obvious, but uh, often so subtle details may be overlooked when embarking on an automation project. So once design decisions have been made and the equipment is built, adding a function or feature can be costly. So thinking through what the finished you know, everything that needs to be accomplished is, is really vital. Thanks, Peter. And the next thing is to understand the environment. In the medical device industry, cleanliness, and in some cases, as we mentioned before, certified clean room compatibility is very important. But the environment also means the working environment, not just the physical environment. What's expected of the operators? What skill level do they and should they have for the process? Yeah, automation almost always requires people to attend to it. Um, and either for maintenance, for feeding it, or um, uh, for um, making sure that um, everything continues to run smoothly. So we have to understand that even with an automated system, uh, how much supervision it will need so taking that into consideration, you need to establish the number of people and the level of training that will be required to keep the automation uh, running successfully. And that takes us to the third key to a successful automation project. So we just mentioned you need to define your expected output, but you also need to set performance expectations for the system. What's the expected throughput? What do you expect for overall equipment effectiveness? How much operator involvement and maintenance is gonna be expected or required? And what's the company's target ROI or return on investment? And I'd like to, to add that um, reliable, reliability of the system is paramount. If the system isn't reliable, then it'll lose the confidence of all the stakeholders and it'll become a drain on resources know, fail to live up to its promise. So um, any automation system has to be built uh, to last and to work uh, consistently and effectively without uh, uh, undue stops and problems. And when we look at the return on investment, you know, return on investment varies depending on how, how sophisticated a project is. But the analysis is often more complex for medical device manufacturers because there are so many factors to consider. But as long as you understand the company's expectation for return on investment or ROI, that can help you decide what to automate when, you, when you're looking to choose between multiple processes or manufacturing steps. Which one gives you the most uh, attractive ROI may lead your decision for what to do first. And it's also important to be realistic about your in-house resources and capabilities for the execution of the project and the long-term operation of the automation system. A robot's just one part of a larger automated system. 
And building a system requires the integration of many different mechanical and electrical components and systems. So you want an experienced integrator or partner who can help you analyze the entire process and define not just the overall system, but what are the individual components and parts that are gonna be needed to make this system do what you need it to do. One thing that's made automating easier in recent years is the increased availability of integrated systems. So you have now robots with integrated vision or parts feeding, you have um, easier to use programming software, but keep in mind that these systems, they're still very large projects. So look for an experienced integrator who can understand the full scope of the project and guide you through the questions to ask, both big picture and those often overlooked details. I, I hope we've illustrated some of the challenges and important topics to consider. It, it's very common for folks to purchase a key piece of equipment uh, for the process and then try to build an automation around that. It's far superior to work with an integrator who can design and build a capable automation system that incorporates those key pieces of equipment as a component. In respect to robots, the, the, the price point is now at a level that robots can be thought of as building blocks rather than uh, the core of the equipment. So multiple robots can often be economically applied with a single into a single automation cell, which vastly increases the range of opportunities uh, uh, and capabilities. Um, a capable integrator can work with you to quickly uh, create a framework of what an automated ver version of your production process would look like and to clear the fog around the, all the considerations that need to be addressed. When we work with our customers, we, we can bring our experience in what works and what doesn't work. And we can also provide them with things to think about to help make the decisions about what and how to automate. It relieves our customers of having to do all of the research themselves. And there's so much that isn't obvious to start with. Thanks, Peter. I don't think the importance of a good partner can be stressed enough. <laughs> So what are our key takeaways? We have an idea of how to get started thinking about automation. For decades, industries like automotive and electronics have used and benefited from automated systems, while other industries, medical and pharmaceutical being two of them, were hesitant to automate, in part due to quality or traceability concerns. But today's robotic automation systems, it can meet the unique requirements of medical device manufacturers whether that be you know, cleanliness and clean room compatibility, verification and traceability, or throughput. And automation can improve quality, it can reduce scrap, and make processes safer for workers. When you're looking to automate, most manufacturers have so many processes, it's hard to decide where to start. But remember, the best candidates are typically those that are consistent, that are repetitive, that are hazardous, or error prone. And automating a process that's currently being done manually or even with a semi-automated system, it's a big undertaking. Systems are complex, planning is critical. That's why it's important to define your expectations, everything from what's your expected throughput to what are your OEE and your ROI. And like we said earlier, partner with an integrator who has experience in your industry and in similar applications. A good partner who understands your product, your process, and your operation can help save you time, cost, and headaches. So thanks for participating in our webinar. We hope you got some useful information out of it, and we do have a couple of additional resources for you. First, Check out Lennon's latest blog post. I think it just posted yesterday. Is it time to automate? And from there, you can also download a decision tree that walks through the key considerations to look at when you're looking at an automation project. And now I'm going to turn it back over to Anna, who's been tracking questions from the participants. So Anna, what do you have for us? Awesome. Thank you so much. What a wonderful presentation. So I do have the first question, and that's, do you have examples of integration partners that Epson has worked with for their clients? 
Yeah, Lennon is a perfect example. <laughs> we work with quite a few system integrators across the country um, that specialize in all different uh, industries or application types. Lennon is a, a very close partner of ours up in the, uh, the Northeast. They're based out of New Hampshire and they specialize, and Peter, correct me if I don't say this quite, quite right, but you guys specialize in really in life sciences, um, manufacturing and process control. Is that correct? That's exactly right. Uh, well, we design systems. Uh, we're especially uh, focused on very compact uh, equipment, uh, again, that goes in clean rooms, and uh, that is very um, specifically designed for a particular manufacturing process. Um, and uh, uh, so uh, that's, uh, that's the core. We also uh, do um, web handling systems and uh, some uh, customized inspection and measurement systems. So uh, we, uh, we love working with Epson and uh, we think the, the Epson robots are a great component to use in uh, that kind of automation. Great, thank you. Um, another one, and that's what can we expect in terms of the cost to implement automation and how expensive is a typical automation project? Peter, do you wanna take that one? <laughs> yeah, well, it's it's impossible <laughs> to say yeah. because uh, there there's such a variety of uh, uh, kinds of systems. Um, the um, it, typically, they run uh, an automation system, may be able to take a existing manual process. If the process is already defined, that's, that's one of the big differentiators. If you're designing a whole new manufacturing process, then there's there's a huge amount of process development and other things. So uh, the project may take span a very long period of time as a lot of prototyping and development is done. Um, and that can lead to um, uh, just a lot of resources uh, being consumed there. Um, other processes are much simpler where you have an existing um, product that you're making, an existing process that you're using. Uh, in that case, um, it's much simpler to define what parts of it can give you some of those benefits that uh, we just talked about in the presentation. And then it's more of a matter of applying uh, automation technology to those particular things. So uh, in that case, uh, the whole process is a much more direct one. We can understand what you're trying to do, and then uh, we can um, uh, very quickly come to some estimate of what the, uh, the expense would be. But really, uh, it's, it's, it's just about impossible to say until we've had a discussion about what needs to be accomplished. Um, and uh, We'd be happy to have that discussion with, with anyone. Uh, we love talking about uh, uh, what the, you know, what your issues, what problems are and come up with potential solutions. And then we can pretty quickly uh, determine what the cost framework will be. Um, but without that information, no one can say. Great, thank you. We have another one um, from Pallavi, a student at Babson. And they're asking, what are some of the issues that a startup can face while balancing costs of automation and the costs of defects and wastage of raw material due to manual operations? So, I'll, go I'll, ahead, Daniel. I'll start the answer and then I'll let Peter expand on it because I'm sure he'll have a lot more insight than I will. But um. That's one of the things when you look at the cost of a project and the, especially the ROI is ROI is not just how many more parts you can produce per hour, per day, per week, whatever. Um, it's also how much are you saving in rework, in scrap, in material cost. 
So that's a very good question because it brings up a good point. And when you're looking at automation, you have to consider not just throughput and production, but you have to consider all those other, you know, we talk about automation um, helping with labor cost. That's true, but it also helps with material costs and quality costs. And quality costs are often overlooked. So if you have automation with a scrap rate of, you know, that is, we'll say, 10 times better, 10 times less, you know, than the manual process, that's a significant cost or cost savings. So um, uh, the question came up uh, or the topic of being a startup came up in there. And, uh, you know, in, in the prior question, we talked about the, the expense of um, automation systems. So, um, there, there are ways that um, you can ease into automation. So if you're a startup um, and, um, you know, budgeting is, is limited, um, you can automate certain parts of your process, possibly economically, and address the things that have the most uh, risk. Like Danielle was saying, um, you want to you want to eliminate um, the, the aspects of it that can uh, possibly uh, create scrap uh, and, uh, and also look at the, the items where you can get the most increase in, in production. So it doesn't always have to be a huge system. So it can be parts of your manufacturing process and you can ease into it. Um, and uh, if, if you're making many, uh, many parts uh, continuously, that's a great thing um, because you will benefit from uh, automating that process. Great, thank you. Another question, and that's how do I know or decide what type of robot I need, whether it's a six axis or something else? Uh, yeah, I'll start this one. <laughs> so we typically have you know SCARA robots and six axis robots. And without um, you know, good examples here other than my arm, uh, SCARA robots have four axes of motion, and they're the type you traditionally see for pick and place applications, you know, back and forth, back and forth, up and down. Six axis robots uh, have obviously six axes of motion, and they're more like your arm from your shoulder. <clears throat> me from your shoulder all the way to your wrist. So they can do much more complex motions. Um, Scara robots tend to be faster uh, and tend to be more precise. There's uh, some debate there. I mean, in general, they're very fast, very precise, pick and place assembly, whereas six axis robots are used more for manipul manipulating things. Um, there's also the question of collaborative versus non-collaborative, which we touched on in the presentation. Um, and I'll let Peter expand on that a little bit. I think he did a very good job of explaining, you know, how um, collaborative robots, even though they get a lot of attention these days, aren't always the best answer. That there's a way, or there are ways to use industrial, traditional industrial robots, non-collaborative ones, in applications very close to human workers um, with proper guarding and safety features. So Peter, if you want to talk about that for a second, I think that would be helpful. We might have lost Peter. I know they're having power Peter, issues. I think you might be on mute. I'm there. sorry. I'm uh, I, I lost the connection for a moment. Um, so uh, yeah, on the topic of Scarab versus six axis, I, th I think a good way to think about it is if you're operating in a single plane, uh, the Scarab robots are excellent. If the part does not have to be uh, turned over or, or uh, presented in a different plane than where it's picked up from, the Scarab robots are great. They're super accurate. Uh, they're very fast. And um, especially with the Epson integrated um, SCARA robots, very, very economical and capable. So the, um, 
uh, anytime that you want to uh, manipulate parts um, from, um, especially if you're using a conveyor or a dial or something like that, and you're adding a component to an assembly or you're uh, inserting one part into another. Um, and if you can present the part with the feeder to the robot in the same plane that it needs to place the part in the assembly, then the Scara robot is by far the, the right choice for uh, that task. Um, if on the other hand, you need to um, uh, operate in multiple planes uh, the uh, the six axis robot can take a part that's presented. Uh, it can hand it to another robot. Um, it can uh, take the part and uh, insert it into an assembly or do something with it that is different in a different plane than it was originally picked up from. So um, the um, if uh, like Danielle said, um, if you need to move the part around in space, think about six axis robots. If you can have the part uh, be um, the, the task that you need to do with the part, if it can be done on the same plane, then the best solution is the SCARA robot. That's a great um, explanation, Peter. I'm gonna remember that one. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. And Danielle, I think you had also mentioned um, collaborative robots, right, at, at some point in the presentation. Can you speak more on those and how you know if you need a collaborative robot or not? Yeah, I think, um, and Peter, jump in anytime you want, because sure. um, you had the perfect example in, in the application example you gave. <clears throat> but I think uh, collaborative robots have gotten a lot of uh, a lot of attention recently. They're definitely a growing market. And they're filling, you know, a need in, in some applications, especially where, especially things like education and training, where the robot is working very close to the human, and there's a lot of chance of contact. So the collaborative robots have uh, certain safety features built in, like um, force limiting. They can uh, sense when there's a certain force on the robot arm, and they can back off. That's if they've hit something or if, um, if a person comes within a certain distance of the robot, they'll slow down, depending on how close the robot and the person are to each other. But these capabilities also limit the robot's um, performance. So you're moving slower, you might be less precise. Um, and industrial robots still, I mean, they still uh, rule, if you will, <laughs> in speed and precision. And there are a lot of things that you can do with uh, safety, with guarding, and um, you know external functions that can protect workers from uh, you know from injury uh, being in contact with a robot in those applications where they need to work closely together. So, Peter, I think your example was um, the the workers were loading parts. Um, very close to where the robot was actually performing the assembly or the, the operation. And you guys right. used external safety features that allowed you to use an industrial robot and get higher throughput and better precision than if you had gone to a collaborative where, yes, you could have maybe eliminated some of the external safety features, but you would have done it at the cost of um, speed, precision, and price because collaborators tend to be many times more expensive than a traditional industrial robot. Yeah, all of that is uh, exactly correct. And um, one thing also to be aware um, that collaborative robots uh, are no longer collaborative once they start operating at the higher speeds of operation because um, if, if they're running at their maximum speed capacity, and um, they hit something, uh, their sensors don't have time uh, to provide that safety. So in, in the, if, if you look at the, the safety requirements of those robots, uh, they require that you limit the speed often to very, very slow uh, process speeds. Uh, so this again is where it's important to make the robot a part of the automation system and, and not design around automation around the robot. And um, so the um, non-collaborative robots uh, can be much tighter, much more uh, precise. Um, 
and they can operate at full speed. You just have to put the proper guarding around them. And, um, and with the collaborative robots, if you're gonna operate them at, at higher speeds, you still have to put the same guarding around them. You have to put the same safety interlocks in there. So you've got a much more expensive um, system uh, that really is not giving you any benefits in that case. You really need to take a look at um, what are you really trying to accomplish? And is there a way that you can use simpler, more economical uh, safety, uh, uh, safety designs and go ahead and, and take advantage of the, uh, the industrial robots at, at their full capacity? Right, thank you, great. Another question, and that's how long does a typical automation project take to implement? So uh, typically right now, um, most uh, companies like ours that are doing automation projects, uh, the time is somewhere between nine months and uh, 12 months. Uh, between the first discussing the project, coming up with a concept, uh, doing the proposals, um, and and then actually building the machine. Uh, right now, typically nine months is, is the minimum. Sometimes it can even span to like a year and a half. Great, thank you. We have another one here, and that's how much technical ability is required on our part? Do we need our engineers and maintenance team who know about automation? Do we need them to know about that? And do we need to know how to code and program robots? Uh, yes and no. So uh, it's very useful to have uh, technical uh, folks for maintenance. Um, and um, uh, But for the actual designing and building of the system, you don't need to be able to program robots. And often there's uh, multiple um, systems that work together. There may be programmable logic controllers that design the, that, that control the peripherals around uh, the robot. And that needs to communicate and interface with the robots and with, with other devices on there. Um, so there's such a diversity of skill sets that are needed there uh, that that's why it's important to work with uh, an integrator who already has those skill sets. And um, also it's much easier to learn um, from the people who've designed uh, a system than to have to figure out uh, all these things by yourself. So for example, if we were to design a, um, a system for a customer, we could also bring in their technical people and teach them the skills that they need, which is much more efficient than having people have they need to, to learn on their own. And again, it comes to this fog of what's needed. Um, uh, if you're if you're going into this not knowing the complexity of all the various elements that go into it, uh, then you don't actually need you you don't actually know what it is that you need to learn, and and that's where where we can help um, in helping understand uh, what the overall system complexity is and what kind of technical skills you'll need. But um, you know you don't need to know how to program. PLCs or robots or anything to uh, create a good automation system. Great, thank you so much for that. And with that, we have reached the end of our program. I wanna take a minute and thank everyone for joining us today. And also thank Epson and Lennon for such a valuable presentation. We cannot put on great educational content like this without your support. So thank you very much. And to learn more about upcoming MassMedic events, check us out on social media, LinkedIn or Twitter, um, or visit MassMedic.com. So thank you so much, everyone, and have a wonderful day. Thanks, Anna. Thanks, Peter. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate it.